Jesus grabbed into my body, grabbed my kidneys out, pulled them out of my body. And I was thinking, hey, I need that. I need those. Han Meditations. Hello, guys. I am Han. This is my wife, Kelly. If you Hello. see us on our phones or taking notes, we are taking notes. So we're, we just like to get all the information we can. We're so excited to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for all your support with the channel. Thank you, everyone who donated. Thank you, everyone who's just been watching the video, commenting. It means the world to us. We've been even more excited to even get into more videos. We're going to start live streaming. If you guys want to see us live stream, let us know in the comments below. And we're, we just want to really get more interaction with you guys. We want more of a community and easier access to us where you guys can talk to us. And we're, we're working on all of this stuff, guys. So we're really happy for this. And uh, let's get into the video. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that He's never going to test or try us except that there will always be ease along with and also after that trial. Mm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that those who are patient will taste the fruits of their patience. And therefore, after the lowest downs, if you like, in the life of the process, and the most traumatic incidents, it was only natural that the Prophet would then be gifted by one of the all-time highs. Some scholars have said this is the greatest miracle that the Prophet has been given personally. And that is the incident of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. Al-Isra means the night journey that the Prophet undertook from Mecca to Jerusalem. Mi'raj actually means the, if you like, item or the mechanism of rising up high. But we refer to it as the actual ascension, not the apparatus, but what the Prophet did, and that is to rise up to the heavens. And so Al-Isra from Mecca to Jerusalem, Al-Mi'raj from Jerusalem to the heavens. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan. All praise be to Allah or may Allah be exalted because he has taken his abd in one night, Laylan, min al-Masjid al-Harami ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa. From the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to the Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, alladhi barakna hawlahu. This Jerusalem, Allah is saying, we have blessed the land around it. Linuriyahu min ayatina. So that we may show him of our wondrous miracles. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma kathab al fu'adu ma ra'a. That the, uh, the chest is not lying, the heart is not lying when it narrates what he saw. Afatu ma runahu ala ma yara. Are you gonna doubt what he saw? Wa laqad ra'ahu nazlatan ukhra inda sidratil muntaha indaha jannatul ma'wa. And indeed he saw him for a second time. He saw him at the sidratil muntaha. Idh yaksha sidra ma yaksha. Ma zaag al basaru wa ma taga. The eyes did not go beyond their mark. They didn't blink. They didn't become scared. He saw of the miraculous signs of his Lord. Notice. You see the parallel? Both surahs mention Isra wal Mi'raj with one reason, and that is to show our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the magnificent signs of Allah Jalla Jalalu. The first question, when did it happen? Probably the strongest position around a year before the Hijrah. The second question, where did it happen from? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when I was in the Hatim, lying down, Jibreel came to me. So this is the most authentic version. There is another version. The Prophet Sallallahu says that when I was in my house, I saw the roof open up and Jibreel come to me. Ibn Hajar says, this shows that he was in his house and Jibreel first took him to the Hatim. What is Al-Hatim? It is the semi-circular region that is outside of the Kaaba. And uh, he says that in the Hatim, Jibreel opened up my chest and he brought a bowl made out of gold that was full of, in one version it says Zamzam, in another version it says full of Iman. And he took out my heart and washed it and put it back. Then Jibreel brought me a Dabba. Dabba is a beast, it's an animal. Duna al baghli wa fawq al himar. It is smaller than a mule and larger than a donkey. Abiyal, pure white. And it was called al buraq. And al buraq, of course, comes from the root of lightning, right? So it's lightning speed. Lightning speed. And the Prophet explained that it puts its hoof. Every hoof of this buraq, it puts it as far as the eye can see. According to another report in Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said it had a muzzle on it. You know what you put on the, the, the harness. It had a harness on it and it had a saddle. Jibreel was holding on to the harness and the Prophet ﷺ stepped onto al buraq He basically mounted al buraq What does an animal do that is mounted by a strange person? Jumps up, it neighs, right? So buraq 
try to do that. And Jibreel basically smacked him. Jibreel yanked the harness and he said, Woe to you! Alam tastahi? Are you not ashamed? For wallahi, no one has ridden you more blessed in the eyes of Allah than your current rider. And the Prophet ﷺ said that I rode him and he took me until we came to Baytul Maqdis. And I tied Al Buraq to the animal post that is used by the Prophets. I went inside and I prayed two rak'at. According to one narration, the Prophet ﷺ prayed two rak'at and when he turned around, فَالْتَفَتُّ فَرَأَيْتُ جَمِيعَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ He saw all of the Prophets lying behind him. From the other narration that we have, the Prophet ﷺ actually says that I saw myself with the other Prophets. And there was Musa praying, قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي And he was a tall and strong and muscular man of a brownish color, as if he is a man from the tribe of Shanu'ah. And in fact, our Prophet ﷺ said that when I was going to Isra al Mi'raj, I passed by the grave of Musa. So this means he passed by his grave and then Allah took him to Masjid, to Masjid al-Aqsa, right? And then Allah took him to the sixth heaven. So he met Musa three times. And I saw Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam standing and praying. And the one who looks most like him is Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. In another version, the Prophet ﷺ said he was whitish in color. Of course, the Arabic is red. As I said before, the Arabs called white people red. And his hair, glistened with water as if he had come out of a steam bath and he is a rather short man compared to Musa. And then he said, and I saw Ibrahim alayhi salam qa'imun yusalli. Notice, Isa standing and praying, Musa standing and praying, Ibrahim is standing and praying, right? As he enters the masjid. And the one who resembles him the most is your own companion, meaning himself. All of the prophets he's seeing are already standing and praying. And this shows us the importance of salah, that even after death, at least for Ibrahim and Musa, as for Isa, he's still alive. The prophets are praying. And then it came the time to salah. salah So I was put the imam of them. So this version has it that he knew exactly what's going on. But the main point is he is leading the Anbiya and the Mursaleen behind him. He is the imam of all of the prophets. Not only this, but by extension, since every prophet is the leader of his ummah, and the Prophet is leading the prophets who leave all the individual ummahs, our Prophet Muhammad Muhammad is the leader of every single ummah, i.e. as he himself said, Ana Sayyidu waladi Adama yawm al -qiyamati wala fakhr. He is the Sayyid. The Sayyid here means the leader, the master. He is the Sayyid of all of the children of Adam on the day of judgment. And then he said, I'm not saying this astaghfirullah to boast or be arrogant. This is just a fact. Then he says that after he finished, in this version, Jibreel comes to him right now and presents two utensils. In another version, Jibreel does this when they ascend up to the heavens. One of them has khamr and the other one has leban, right? So there's wine and there is milk. Wine is still halal. The Muslims of Mecca are drinking wine. And Jibreel says, choose and choose for your ummah. So the Prophet ﷺ chose the milk and Jibreel says, you have chosen the fitrah. Asabtal, you have chosen the right one and that is the fitrah. That is when the Jibreel came to him and the Prophet ﷺ says, Jibreel asked permission for the doors of the heavens to open. And the gatekeeper behind the door asked, who is it? So Jibreel says, it is Jibreel. And the gatekeeper said, do you have anybody? And Jibreel said, yes, I have with me Muhammad Wasallam. The gatekeeper says, has he been sent for? Jibreel says, yes. So then the doors open up. So for every single one of the seven heavens, the same story happens. They get to the second heaven and it's closed. Jibreel asks permission. The gatekeeper says, who is there? Jibreel says, it's Jibreel. He says, is anybody with you? The same conversation. Every single one of the seven heavens. The Prophet ﷺ goes to the first door. The first door opens and there is a man standing. The Prophet ﷺ described him as being tall, huge. And Jibreel says, this is your father Adam. So say salam to him. So the Prophet ﷺ said salam and Adam responded and said, Marhaban bil ibn salih wa nabi salih Welcome, O noble son and O noble prophet. Welcome, O righteous son and O righteous prophet. In the second heaven, there is Yahya and Isa ibn al Khal, i.e., their two mothers were sisters, right? So Maryam and her sister, and the Prophet was told, This is Yahya and Isa, say salam to them. And so I said salam to them, and they said, Welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. Then the third heaven, and in the third heaven was Yusuf. السلام, and the same thing, Welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. And here is where the Prophet said the famous phrase, I saw Yusuf, and lo and behold, 
it was as if he had been given half of all beauty. Shatr al husn Then I went up to the fourth heaven, and in the fourth was Idris alayhi salam. And Idris also says, Welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. Then I go up to the fifth heaven, and there is Harun, and the same, Welcome, O noble brother and noble prophet. I go up to the sixth heaven, and there is Musa. Then I went up, Musa began to cry. So he was asked, Why are you crying? So Musa says, I am crying because this young man who was sent after me shall have a larger following that will enter Jannah than my own Ummah. And then he said that I went up to the seventh heaven, the same question back and forth with Jibreel. And then I saw Ibrahim alayhi salam and he was sitting with his back leaning on the Al Baytul Ma'mur. What is Al Baytul Ma'mur? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Wa Tur wa Kitabim Mastur fi Raqim Manshur. Well, Bayt al Ma'mur. It's in the Quran, Surah Al Tur. Al Bayt al Ma'mur means the frequented house. The only information we have about Al Bayt al Ma'mur is that the Prophet said it is a house similar to the Kaaba. In one version, it is the Kaaba of the heavens. Just like there's a Kaaba on earth. In another version, it is above the Kaaba on earth, such that if it were to fall, it would fall on the Kaaba on this earth. So it is above the Kaaba of this earth. And every single day since Allah has created the creation, 70,000 angels enter. Al Bayt al Ma'mur to basically do tawaf and pray, and those 70,000 never return, and every single day this happens. And Ibrahim is there because he is the one who built the Kaaba on earth, so he deserves to be associated with the Kaaba in the heavens. And Jibreel said to me, This is your father Ibrahim, Hada Abuka Ibrahim, say salam to him. And so the Prophet ﷺ said salam to him, and Ibrahim responded the exact same way that Adam had responded. Notice the beginning and the end of the same response, right? Welcome, O noble son and O noble prophet. So notice the Dabba or Buraq is still tied at the post, okay? So the journey is very simple. From Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. From Masjid al-Aqsa up to the heavens, then he's going to come back down and then use Buraq to get back to Mecca. The Prophet wasallam said that on the night he went to Isra wal Mi'raj, he met Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. So they began talking about the Day of Judgment. And Ibrahim was the first to be asked, tell us about the Day of Judgment. So Ibrahim said that I don't have any knowledge about the Day of Judgment. They asked Musa and Musa as well said, I don't have any knowledge. They asked Isa and Isa said that I have been promised or informed that, that one of the signs of it is that I will be coming back. And Allah Azza wa knows when that is and the Jal will come. So Isa says that I know that Allah will send me back to this earth and I will kill the Dajjal and the people will then go to their various countries and lands and Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come forth as Allah says in the Quran, Amin kulli hadabin yansilun. From every single valley, from every single area they're going to come and every water they pass by, Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be drinking this water and finishing it up until I will make dua to Allah that they be killed. And so Allah Azza wa Jal will kill the Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the entire world will be stenched with their decomposed bodies. As far as one can smell, one can smell their scent, their putrid smell. I will then make dua to Allah to get rid of these bodies. So Allah will send rain from the sky and these bodies will be washed away. And when this happens, I have been told the day of judgment will be like a pregnant woman who's about to give birth. It's going to happen at any time. And the Prophet ﷺ says, what Isa says, we find it in the Quran. Seems very clear that the Prophet ﷺ is engaging in conversations with the other Prophets. Where did this happen? Did it happen in Baytul Maqdis? One possibility. Did it happen when he's moving up to the heavens? Another possibility. There's another conversation that is recorded. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَقِيتُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَيْلَةَ أُسْرِيَ بِي I met Ibrahim the night that I went on the Isra. And he told me, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Aqri ummataka minnis salam Give my salams to your ummah And inform them wa akhbirhum Anna al-jannata tayyib al-turbah That jannah, its soil is beautiful and luscious Wa anna haqi'an 
but it is barren. And the seedlings that we put in this soil will come from everybody saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Every Subhanallah becomes a tree. Every La ilaha illallah becomes a tree. Every Allahu Akbar becomes a tree. It is also narrated, and again, we don't know when. Perhaps this happened in Baytul Maqdis. Perhaps it happened after the seventh heaven. That he met Malik. So our Prophet ﷺ said that Jibreel said to me, O oh Muhammad ﷺ, this is Malik, the Khazin of Jahannam, the gatekeeper of Jahannam, give him salam. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I turned around to greet him before I could say anything. He was the one who greeted me, so I returned the salam. And he did not smile at all. He seemed completely somber and completely sad. And so the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel, why is he like this? And so Jibreel responded that he has never smiled or laughed since he has been created because his job is Jahannam. And once he's seen Jahannam, he has never smiled or laughed. But Jibreel added, were he to have smiled for anybody, it would have been you. He then proceeded onward. So we are now basically above the seventh heaven. He has met all of the prophets, including Ibrahim alayhi salam. And now he proceeds onwards above this. What is beyond this? He said, and then I saw in front of me the Sidratul Muntaha. What is the Sidratul Muntaha? The Sidra is a type of tree that is known for its large branches and it's known for its delicious fruit and sweet scent. And Muntaha means the very end. So the Sidra at the end, this is how it translates into. In English, this is called the Lot tree. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the fruits of this tree were as large as the water jars of Hajar. And then he said, its leaves are like the ears of the elephants. And then I was told, Hadihi Sidratul Muntaha. This is the Sidratul Muntaha. In a hadith in Bukhari, he said, Thumman Talaqabi. Then Jibreel continued going up with me until we got to the Sidratul Muntaha. There were colors basically going up and down the tree. I don't know what those colors are. And Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says in the Quran, That when the tree was covered up by what it was covered up with, Allah doesn't tell us what. This is the last thing that the Prophet saw before he went above to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that everything that rises up from earth stops at Sidrat al-Muntaha. Allah says in many verses that Allah raises those things up. The souls, prayers, duas, good deeds, right? Kalim al all of these things, Allah raises it up. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that the Prophet ﷺ said, then I, when I went on the Isra, I stopped at the Sidrat al-Muntaha and he said, it is in the sixth heavens. At the Sidrat al-Muntaha, everything that ascends up from the earth stops there. And it is basically absorbed by the Sidrat al-Muntaha. And from it descends down everything that is coming to this earth and it emerges from it. So Allah's Rahmah and the rain and anything that Allah wants to send down starts from the Sidratul Muntaha. The Prophet ﷺ said, Farashun min Zahab. So one of the things that is surrounding the tree are beautiful butterflies with exotic colors made out of gold. Ma zag al basar wa ma tagha. The eyes of the Prophet ﷺ did not move beyond that, nor did they go astray. Then Allah says, لَقَدْ رَأَ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Looking at this tree, Allah says, He has seen of the ayat al-kubra. And if Allah is saying this is a major ayah, then what is bigger than this, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, It kept on changing until nobody can describe it for you. It's an ever-changing tree. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, And at the base of the Sidratul Muntaha, there are four rivers coming down. Two of these are hidden and two of these are open. So I said to Jibreel, what are these rivers? So Jibreel said, as for the hidden ones, they are ones in Jannah. You're not gonna see them in this world. And as for the ones that everybody can see, the river Nile and the Euphrates River. Jibreel is telling him that the Nile and the Euphrates are blessed rivers. As for the two rivers of Jannah, they are al kawthar and sal Sabil. In one version, the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ رُفِعَ لِي الْبَيْتُ الْمَعْمُورِ Then I saw al baytul Ma'mur. In one hadith, it says that, so I passed basically Ibrahim in the seventh heaven, and then I saw Sidrat al-Muntaha. In the other hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, and then I went to Sidrat al-Muntaha, and it is in the sixth heavens. 
Imam al Nawawi tries to explain this, and it seems like a good explanation. The trunk of the tree begins in the sixth heaven, but its branches finish at the end of the seventh heaven. Nothing of the creation of this world, at least, is beyond the Sidrat al Muntah, right? The only thing that is beyond it is the throne and the one who is above the throne. And then he saw Jibreel alayhi salam in his original form. Jibreel had 600 wings, he blocked the entire horizons, and he said in another hadith. In Tabari, from the feathers of Jibreel's wings, pearls and corals were dripping. Allah says in the Quran, most of the angels, Allah says, two or three or four wings. But Jibreel alayhi salam, in this hadith we learn he has 600 wings. Three things he saw one after the other at the highest level. Number one, Sidrat al Muntaha. Number two, Baytul Ma'mur. Number three, Jibreel. This is the reference in the Quran. He saw of his major signs. And it is said that the Prophet only saw Jibreel in his original form twice. Then Ibn Mas'ud said the Prophet was given three things. Number one, the five salah. We're going to come to that. Number two, Khawatimu Surat al Baqarah. The ending of Surat al Baqarah. And number three, Allah promised him that whoever worshipped him from his ummah without doing shirk, that he will be forgiven and caused to enter Jannah. And the Prophet said that the last two verses of Surah Baqarah have been given them from underneath the throne of the treasure of Allah. And we know that whoever recites these two verses, Allah will uh, protect him. In another hadith, he said, whoever recites these two verses on a nightly basis, يعني kafatahu. They're going to be enough for him. He doesn't need anything else. It was then that the Prophet ﷺ went to the gist of Al-Isra. And that is the divine appointment. In Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, Then I was caused to ascend forth in the singular, not Jibreel anymore. And I rose to a level where I could hear the pen writing. As the Prophet ﷺ said, the first thing that Allah created was the pen. And then Allah told the pen, Uktub. So the pen asked Allah, what should I write? And Allah said, write everything that will happen until the end, until Yawm Al-Qiyam. Write everything. He went beyond Jibreel. He went beyond even the Sidrat Al-Muntaha. And he heard the divine pen as it was writing in the book that Allah Azza wa has with him. There is a book that Allah has above the throne. And therefore, it is, inshallah, legitimate to say that the Prophet went to a level that no living creature has ever been to as far as we know. But we don't have any details about what was said except for the 50 salawat. That Allah Azza wa Jal, Furidat Aliyah, the Prophet said, Furidat Aliyah as salawatu khamsina salatan kulla yawm. 50 salawat every single day. And he goes back down and he meets Musa. What did your Lord tell you for your ummah? So here the Prophet says that my Lord told me that I should tell my ummah to pray 50 times a day. Here Musa says, Go back to your Lord and tell him to lower this. Because I have more experience than you with the Bani Israel and your Ummah will not be able to do 50 times a day. The Prophet ﷺ looked at Jibreel wanting to get his opinion. The riwayah says, as if he's getting his opinion. And Jibreel nodded to him, yes, do that. So the Prophet ﷺ went back up. Now here is where the riwayah differ. Some of them say it went down 5, 5, 5. Others say it went down 10, 10, 10. But really the point is the same. And that is multiple times back and forth, back and forth, at least five times. And every time Musa is telling him the same thing, that go back to your Lord and ask him to lower it because I have tested the children of Israel and they will not be able to do this. Your ummah will not be able to do this. Until finally when he came back down with five, this was when Musa said it one more time and the Prophet ﷺ said, I have gone back and forth until I am embarrassed now, but I am content and happy. So when he said this, a voice called out. And this is the voice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My faridha has been established and I have made things easier for my servants. It is five, but it shall be rewarded with 50. So the messenger is summoned to the presence of the divine. And what is then decreed? And that is the salah. It was so important that the messenger was called to the king of kings to receive the message directly from the divine.
there is a controversy, did he see Allah or not? The strongest opinion is we'll talk about he did not see Allah, but he had a private meeting in which he saw the veil of Allah. And this is clearly proven that Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala an asked him directly, did you see your Lord? And the Prophet responded, there was light. How could I see him? There was the light of Allah's hijab. Because another hadith of Sahih Muslim says, Allah has a hijab of nur. If Allah were to lift this veil, then the rays that come from his face would destroy everything that it sees. The beginning portions of Surah Al-Najm describe certain of these incidents. وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى That when the star, when it goes down, your companion has neither gone astray nor has he erred, and he's not speaking from his imagination. What he is saying in هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى This is wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just the Qur'an, everything that he's seeing is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى He has been taught by the one who is mighty in power. The reference is Jibreel. ذُو مِرَّةٍ فَاسْتَوَى ذُو مِرَّةٍ means he is free of any defect. فَاسْتَوَى وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى means Jibreel revealed himself at the highest of heavens. ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى And then Jibreel came closer and closer. فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدَنَى Jibreel was closer to the Prophet ﷺ than two bows like, you know, bow and arrow. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى After the encounter with Jibreel, he moved on to an even higher encounter where Allah inspired his servant with whatever he inspired. There's secrecy here. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادِ the chest is not lying in what it saw. Are you going to argue with him with what he saw? He saw of the most amazing miracles and signs of his Lord. Then the Prophet ﷺ goes back down and he tells us many things that he saw on the way down. It is almost impossible to piece together the exact order of events. We simply have a hadith. There's a very long hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmad where the Prophet ﷺ mentions on the night that I went on Isra wal Mi'raj, I smelt a fragrance that was very sweet. And so I asked Jibreel, what is this beautiful fragrance? So Jibreel said, this is the fragrance of the one who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun and her children. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I asked Jibreel, what is their story? How come their fragrance is so strong? So Jibreel said, once when she was combing the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun, the comb fell from her hands and she said, Bismillah. So the daughter said, surely you mean the name of my father because for her daughter's perspective, my father is God. And so this woman said, no. My Lord and your Lord is Allah, and the Lord of your father is Allah. And the girl said, do you want me to tell my father you said this? And this woman whose name we don't even know said, yes, go ahead. And so when Fir'aun found out, he called this slave girl and asked her, are you saying you have a Rabb besides me? Because Fir'aun used to say, Ana rabbukumul a'la. And Fir'aun used to say, as the Quran says, Qala hal alimtu lakum ilahin ghayri. Did I ever teach you there's another God besides me? Because he has to teach his people about God. And this is exactly what he asked this lady as well. She said, yes, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. And so Fir'aun ordered that a cauldron be put of fire and it was boiled in front of her and she was told that she has to throw her own children into the fire one by one or else acknowledge Fir'aun as her Rabb. She said, I have one request, O Fir'aun. Fir'aun said, what? He said, that you bury me and my children all together. You take all of our flesh and bones and you bury them in one location. So Fir'aun said, this is a condition that we have upon you. And so one by one, her children were thrown in until finally the last one that was left was her baby that was suckling at her bosom. And this was the one that she could not, she paused at. And so the baby spoke to his own mother and said, Oh my mother, go forth and drop yourself in. Because this punishment of this world is nothing compared to the punishment of the next. And so she threw herself in. And what is amazing is that subhanAllah, we don't even know her name. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recorded her plight and narrated it to the Ummah. Her courage and bravery, Allah had willed that it would be preserved for the Ummah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said in Sahih Bukhari, Then I entered into Jannah, and there are some versions of the hadith which says, I saw Jannah, and that's different than saying enter Jannah. And I saw in it tents made out of pearls, and I saw that the soil of Jannah was made out of musk. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said he saw many of the punishments of hell. 
So in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw the punishment of the one who stole an orphan's money, that they had noses like that of camels, and they would be eating coals made out of fire, and their mouths would swallow these coals, and it would come out through their anuses. The Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith that he saw people who had nails of copper, and they were scratching their bodies and their faces with this, and these were the people who used to backbite. The Prophet said, I saw people, they had in front of them pure meat, and they had rotten infested meat. And they were eating the rotten and infested meat, and avoiding the pure meat. I said to Jibreel, who are these people? And Jibreel said, these are the people that used to fornicate. They would leave the halal, meaning their spouses, and they would go to the haram. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that he saw people with such large bellies that they could not stand up. They were on the ground and animals were being brought over them to trample over them as a punishment. And when he asked who they were, Jibreel said, these were the people who would get their money from riba. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ also said that he saw people who were cutting their own lips and their tongues with uh, scissors of copper and scissors of uh, punishment and fire. He asked Jibreel who these people were. Jibreel said these were the people who used to tell others to do good and they would forget themselves. The Prophet ﷺ also said, and I saw the Dajjal. And one of his eyes was bloated. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that I saw the Dajjal and I will tell you something about the Dajjal that no other Prophet has ever told his people and that is that his left eye is like a rotten grape. And the Prophet ﷺ said, know that the Dajjal is A'war and A'war is one-eyed. The Prophet ﷺ came back down to Jerusalem and he then rewrote Buraq. So Buraq is tied up in Jerusalem, right? Remember, Buraq is an animal that is for this world to transport him from Mecca to Jerusalem. As for the transportation from Jerusalem to the heavens, this is what is called Al Mi'raj. So when he gets back down to Jerusalem, he then rides the Buraq back to Medina. And there are some narrations that are not fully authentic, but there's no problem in them to affirm them as well that the Prophet ﷺ passed by three caravans of the Quraysh that he recognized. Recognized. When he came back to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ went back to sleep, he said, and he woke up in the Haram. And this clearly shows, therefore, that the actual Isra took place from the Haram itself to Baytul Maqdis and then back to the Haram. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when I woke up the next morning, I felt an anxiety about how am I going to tell the people of what happened to me? And what will they say? And they are going to reject me. And as I was sitting, anxious and nervous and worried, he's sitting in front of the the enemy of Allah Abu Jahl passed by me and he saw me in that state. And so Abu Jahl said to him in a sarcastic manner, what is the matter with you? Why? Has anything happened? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, something happened. So Abu Jahl said, what? So the Prophet ﷺ said, yesterday, last night, I was taken from here to Jerusalem. So Abu Jahl was shocked and he said, and you are now here amongst us. You're now waking up amongst us. And so the Prophet ﷺ himself said, he didn't know whether to make fun of me then or to wait so that I would not retract when he called the other people. The Prophet said, yes, I'm waking up amongst you here. So Abu Jahl said, if I call your people, meaning the Quraysh, will you tell them what you have just told me? And so the Prophet said, yes, I will. And so Abu Jahl began screaming out to the people, Hayya ma'ashara bani Ka'b ibn Lu'ay, which is the great grandfather of the Quraysh. Come forth, we have an announcement to make. And so the people came slowly from the places of Mecca. And so Abu Jahl says, tell them what you promised you would tell them. And so the Prophet said, last night I went to Bayt al-Maqdis and I went to pray in the Masjid al-Aqsa, the Bayt al-Maqdis. So the people began reacting in different ways. Some of them began musaffiq, just like clapping like in what is going on here. Others put their hands on their heads not knowing what to do. And others began snickering and laughing until one of them said, and he had been there to Bayt al-Maqdis, can you describe it for us? Because everybody knew that the Prophet had never been to Bayt al-Maqdis, right? And so the Prophet said, I began describing the Bayt al-Maqdis until they began to ask ask me about specifics that I wasn't able to recall. I got confused and I became so worried and anxious that I wasn't able to answer that I had never been so worried before. And he said, as I was waiting for what to respond, I saw in the distance Baytul Maqdis rising up in front of me until I saw it descending beyond the house of Aqil ibn Abi Talib. And this is the house that he grew up in because Abu Talib had died and Aqil is now living in it, right? The house that he grew up in, not the house he's currently living in, that's Khadija's house. And no question they asked of me, except that I saw the Baytul Maqdis, right, basically being shown to me. And I looked at them and I answered every 
every question that they had until finally one of them said, as for the descriptions of Baytul Maqdis, then of Jerusalem, then he is accurate. The Prophet ﷺ said, and Ibn Hisham mentions this, I will give you some signs as well. And he mentioned the three caravans. He mentioned the first caravan is of so-and-so and they will be returning soon because they were the closest to the city. The second caravan is so-and-so and they had lost a camel and you can ask them about that camel they were searching for. It. The third caravan is such and such and they had this urn of water that I drank from. Abu Jahl said, if you saw them at such and such a place, the caravan should be coming right now because it was very close to Mecca. And while they're discussing, the news arrives that the caravan is entering Mecca. And so Abu Jahl goes and sees and it is exactly as the Prophet ﷺ described and he comes back and saying, this is clear sorcery. And of course it was at this time when one of the Quraysh came running to Abu Bakr and said, do you know what your companion has just said? Said what? He said, your companion claims to have gone all the way to Jerusalem, which is a month's journey, and back, which is another month's journey. And he did all of this in one night. Abu Bakr said, if he said that, then it must be true. So the man said to him, do you believe him in such a claim? And so Abu Bakr said, I believe him in something that is even more amazing than this. He claims that the revelation from above the seven heavens comes to him instantaneously, which is more amazing. Just to go to Jerusalem and come back or that Allah is communicating with him instantaneously. And so because of this, Abu Bakr was called as siddiq If you think about it, in this journey of Isra wal Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ physically saw all of the pillars of Iman. He saw the hijab of Allah and he spoke directly with Allah. He saw numerous angels and he saw the angel Jibreel in the original form. He met all of the prophets and he spoke to them. And this is the prophets in the books, right? And he spoke to them about the day of judgment. And he spoke to them about the signs of the day of judgment. And he saw heaven and hell, which are going to take place after the day of judgment. And he even saw the reality of Qadr. How? When the Prophet ﷺ went up and he saw Adam alayhi salam, he actually saw Adam surrounded by many, many people beyond what he could count. And on the right side of Adam was one group, on the left side, another group. And when he saw Adam alayhi salam, saw the people on his right, he was happy. And when he saw the people on the left, he began to cry. So he asked Jibreel about this and Jibreel said, these are all of the children of Adam. The Ashabu al-Yameen are the people of Jannah. The Ashabu al-Shimal are the people of Jahannam. So when he looks at the people of Jannah, he's happy. And when he looks at the people of Jahannam, he is saddened by seeing Adam with the right and the left and by one more thing, the pen, the writing of the pen, hearing the pen, the Iman of the Prophet after literally seeing with his own eyes all of these pillars of Iman, you understand that this was a personal gift to the Prophet wasallam to increase his own Iman. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Kelly, wow. That's a lot to unpack. That's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. That is a lot to unpack. I was trying to take the best notes that I can, find different information that we can talk about. It was just so much. It was too much. <laughs> but I want to just start off by saying that was an incredible narration. The story, the, the entire production of it was compelling and interesting. And I very much enjoyed that. Now, what that reminded me of, too, was... At the end, it sounded like he was astral projecting. I was going to say that. See, a lot of people always think all this stuff is kooky and weird, but that is essentially what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was doing was astral projecting to another plane of reality in which he could see things that he wouldn't have known. That's why whenever people talk about meditation and when people talk about sorcery people thought what he was doing was sorcery at the time but it came from god that's why whenever we're doing past life regressions whenever we're doing healing whenever we're doing all of this stuff with meditations all of it comes from god there is no sorcery involved there is no magic there is no jinn involved this is all positivity that comes from god everything and anything we do is positivity that comes from god so i just wanted to say like a quick recap of what i thought was interesting but some of the stuff that I got was it talked about ease after a trial. There's going to be a lot of ease after a trial, reminding me of what's been going on with us, right? Now, mm -hmm. everything hasn't been easy and <laughs> sweet, but in, in essentially, we've been in a time where we've been relaxing compared to where we were two years ago. Oh, this is easy. This is yeah. nothing. Because two years ago, it was extreme situation, extreme stress, extreme trauma, extreme doing surgeries, doing procedures every single day day tubes hanging out of my body blood coming it was just the most intense experience and now it's just been so easy we have a community everything's going perfectly thanks to you guys thanks to god i mean it's such a beautiful experience so then it said you'll be essentially paid great rewards for patience 
Mm-hmm. And that's how it was for us for two years, more than two years. We're waiting. Oh, is this going to happen now? Is this going to happen? Just being patient, getting rid of the Insistence forceful nature. Yeah, exactly what I wanted to say, Kelly. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Insistence and resistance, because you can't have an insistence on an outcome. You have to have just in a place of in between, a place of calm, a place of relaxation. So he was saying that Jibril took out his heart, washed it, cleansed it and put it back. And that's like, you guys, Basically you have to understand. Cleared his heart. Listen, chakra. you have to understand. <laughs> Basically, cleared his heart chakra. But just the probably two weeks ago, I did a meditation. I was telling Kelly, and Jesus, Isa, Yeshua came to me in the meditations. If you know, if you're watching the channel, you know I got diagnosed with stage five kidney disease. They said I wouldn't get better. I did get better. It was a miracle from God. In the meditation, I was completely outside of my body. I felt Isa. I felt Yeshua there behind me. He grabbed into my body. Jesus grabbed into my body, grabbed my kidneys out, pulled them out of my body. And in the thing, during whenever it was happening, I was thinking, hey, I need that. I need those. You know what I mean? Like, what's going on? You know, (laughs) then he replaced my kidneys. It felt like he cleansed them, replaced them with two balls of light, which I know my kidneys were in there. But it was like he just cleansed them with light and put them back into my body. And it was such an insane and cool experience. And this was after we started the journey of Islam and learning about it, which is such a cool and awesome experience. So I know what that's like to be to have a crazy experience and whenever you tell people they're like you're crazy that's sorcery this is that blah, blah, blah. but no that's exactly what happened and it came from god yes. and and then it was talking about um he went on the horse and he saw himself praying with the other prophets and then he had to choose between the milk and the wine he chose the milk and then he mm-hmm. kept going. And then the first the first heaven he got to, he saw Adam. The second heaven, he saw Jesus. The third one, he saw Yusuf. The fourth one, Idris. The fifth one, Aaron or Haran. The sixth one was Musa. And if you don't know who these people are, Adam, of course, he was the first. Peace be upon him. The first prophet. Mm-hmm. Then uh, Jesus, everyone knows who he is. Peace be upon him. And all the prophets I'm going to name. Peace be upon them all. Everyone knows Jesus and Adam. Then there's Yusuf who was known for the story in the Quran where he was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers and eventually rose to a position of power in Egypt. He interpreted dreams and displayed patience and piety throughout his trials. Then there's Idris. And we did the, uh, we, we saw the prophet series of Idris. He was mm-hmm. the first one to actually write with the pen. Yeah. He was a, a warrior, essentially. He was the first one to take up arms in the name of God. Also known as fighting Enoch. Shaitan. Yeah, also known as Enoch. Very good, Kelly. And he's mentioned in Islamic tradition as a prophet who lived a righteous life and was taken up to heaven without experiencing death. And then that's whenever he tried to say, hey, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to die any more time. And then God took his life at the third heaven, I believe. So and then Aaron or Haran, he was uh, the older brother of Moses and served as his spokesman. Mm -hmm. He played a significant role in leading the Israelites out of Egypt and was appointed by God as a prophet to assist Moses in his mission. Then we have Moses himself. Everybody knows the story of Moses. And then the last one was Ibrahim or Abraham. Abraham is considered the patriarch of monotheism in Islam and Judaism and Christianity. Hmm. He is revered for his unwavering faith and obedience to God, as demonstrated by his willingness to sacrifice his son Ishmael, Ismail, in obedience to God's commands. So hmm. he saw all of them. And then, you know, Ibrahim was in the seventh heaven and it even talked about basically they're saying your following is going to be bigger than mine, this and that, blah, blah, blah. It kind of reminded me of the Dolores Cannon's books where they talk about the silver cord and whenever you do more, whenever you're in the Akashic records, is it called Akashic? Akashic records. Akashic. I always forget the name, but it's supposed to be this place where all the information is gathered. That's what it was thinking about when it was talking about the divine pen and the divine book and yeah, then how, that's exactly what i thought yeah and then the, the more you do essentially people their silver line in terms of gold rope are very elaborate and yeah. it's just the more change that you do to help people and then he saw the light of god and then whenever he told people he told them that they were that some people were clapping some people were snickering and laughing and he had anxiety about the whole situation i don't want to tell people he probably felt embarrassed about it 
to even be saying something that crazy. Mm -hmm. And then whenever he started answering all their questions, they started believing it. And that's whenever the whole astral projection thing started happening. So, Kelly, what did you think about that? And kind of give me your opinion on what you thought of it. I know I just said a lot. Yes, there's certainly a lot to unpack in that story, but it's very fascinating. But that's exactly what I was thinking through it, because it even mentions that he came came back and then he just went to sleep like he was almost in that kind of state. And 100 percent, it sounded just like astral projecting because, you know, this body is just a vessel. But who we truly are is inside our soul, you know, which is completely limitless so to go from here to here is is nothing because time and space are not really real they're all now everything exactly is now. it's everything more of the here. physical reality yeah. so it's very very possible for our souls to do and the other thing is when we dream that's what our souls are doing anyway mm. we're just not conscious of it so for him to go and see all the other prophets that was incredible and that goes to show as well that even if you know, we die physically, our souls are still going on. And for many of us, and especially the prophets or those of us who have big roles to do, our souls are still working and still doing stuff. As you saw, they were all praying. So this is important, important stuff, way beyond the physical, way beyond this life. It goes to the soul level. So what's interesting is once he got up there, he saw a house what they describe similar as the Kaaba kind of maybe some people describe it as the Kaaba of you know up there the heavens and it said 70,000 people enter angels. daily angels and never leave so that was just very very interesting to me that sounded like they're going back to God they're going back to source energy they're I going back so to too. the one mm -hmm. God is accepting them back giving them, them the highest honor of coming back to him essentially exactly and Issa knew about the final days, of course, because he has a large part in it and a large role. And I've been noticing a lot lately how water is a very big part in Islam, which I think is really cool because I myself feel very, very connected to Islam. And I've been looking into more about how to do the daily prayer. And I learned that you do a water cleansing of, you know, your face, your wrists and your hands and everything. And even throughout this story, there's lots of water, water cleansing. Of course, Issa said that, yes, there's going to be burning flesh of all the people that didn't do the right thing in the end times. But he asked Allah to rinse it all away with water. And water is just so cleansing and purifying. So I really liked that. I thought yeah. it was very, very interesting. Even in Christianity, water plays a big part with the mm -hmm. baptism and all that. And yeah. one of the messages that Kelly got, I believe it was from Jesus, was that whenever because i couldn't shower for over a year i had to take baths because i had a tube connected to my artery in my heart and if it got water in it i would die so i had to take baths and make sure that it was not getting wet now during that time actually kelly received a message when she was doing reiki healings for me that hey guess what whenever you get to the point where you can shower again it'll be like a cleansing of water where the water is going to be washing over you almost like a new baptism to God and you'll just be cleansing. And I've always, I've always cleansed my hands and washed them and it felt like there's energy in that. So I love hearing that. And I love that aspect of it. Yeah, definitely. So he goes up there. I also like the concept of the four rivers. So two of the rivers are Nile and Euphrates, which are obviously rivers that exist here on earth, but two cannot be seen. And honestly, a river is a place that we go, a very sacred place that we go to in healing. And I've just seen before and it is very, very cleansing. So this is a place in the astral. Obviously, it doesn't exist here physically, but I wonder if this is something that has to do with those two rivers that cannot be seen. And also said that Jabril had 600 wings when most of them had, most angels have two or three wings. Another interesting thing, because another message that we've gotten before with doing healings on Han is that he had wing, has wings and we can't see them here in the physical, but he does have wings that are, are seen on, you know, the spiritual, the soul level. And, and she got that months over a year ago. And Long she was like, you're ago. supposed to be meditating with the wings. And I always see birds all the time mm -hmm. in a very weird way. 
So even whenever they were taking my dialysis machine from my house, there was a bird right above my car, which is just absolutely freaky. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I will show you guys that too, because we are going to make a whole documentary about what happened in our journey to God. And it's just, it's been so fun and so awesome. So keep going. Absolutely. Sorry, I keep inter interrupting you. No problem. So I forget which prophet it was, but I think maybe Jabril said that he was crying because he saw that Muhammad would have even more of a larger following than him. And of course, these weren't cries like, oh, mm, he's going to have more people than me, not not crying because of the ego, mm -hmm. because he's actually just generally happy and just seeing it all with love. So that goes to show that these prophets are just they don't have their egos involved. They truly just want everyone to be more connected to God and better version of themselves. And he was crying because he was so grateful for it, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. not because upset, obviously. But I'm sure he was upset. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm joking. Guys. That'd be kind of funny, but. No, I was thinking the same thing too, because it was like, almost like everybody just wants the same goal, mm -hmm. which is to bring people to God. Right. So either you're bringing people to God or you're not. And that's really why we started this channel, because guess what? You don't have to start a channel like me. If you feel obligated to do it, if you feel that's your calling, go ahead. But even for me, whenever it was, it was, I felt like how Muhammad, peace be upon him, was feeling like it's like embarrassing when I have all these stories about Jesus coming to me, about wings on my back, about <laughs> all the stuff. If you go back and watch the channel months ago, I mean, it's like embarrassing to even say this kind of stuff. But whenever you start doing it and you have your face attached to it, it really is a big deal. Even just starting the meditations and putting my voice on it, it was a big deal for me. So mm -hmm. one of the things is you can just share the video. You can like the video. You can comment. You can show someone another video. It doesn't matter. Whatever you feel obligated to do, you can do it. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. So finally, when we find out that Allah, the first thing he created was a pen to keep track of everything essentially and there's a big book and that absolutely pen. yeah it's a very divine pen absolutely reminds me of the concept of the akashic records if you never heard of that it's essentially just a record of every single life every single being all of their actions every deed and it's all recorded and written down and it's really interesting because some people are said to be able to access that through astral projection and they can go to this place called the library where all this information is stored. And of course, it just appears to as a library in our minds because that's just what we can relate as humans on this earth. So that's how we can perceive it. But I'm sure it's not necessarily that. It's just the way it appears. So that's absolutely what that reminded me of. So I just think this story was very cool because we're seeing a lot of connections between whatever you want to call it, new age, spiritualism. And we can see how it's really intertwined in this story and how there's way more connections between all of this than we all might realize. So I think that was really beautiful. And finally, it said that he was seeing the veil of Allah because it was just a very bright light. And in the practice that I do, past life regression or QHHT, there's people who are, when they went in to see a past life, well, this was actually their first life on earth. So they said that they were actually just going to this big ball of light and they were just a little particle of this big ball of light. Like they basically came straight from that source. And it sounds like the exact same description as that veil where it's just this huge light. All you know is love and oneness. And it's very much essentially the closest you can get to being with God, being with Allah. Uh, and finally, I just really liked the story of the woman who was combing the hair and she knew that Allah was the true Lord and she wasn't afraid. It was, you know, a sad story to hear about what would happen to her and her children, but she was clearly very, very greatly rewarded on the other side which matters the most and i think these stories are very very important i really like how there's these stories of these women who in their own way rebelled but in the right way just like the midwives who rebelled when it was time to kill all of the babies and they decided to not kill the baby moses <clears throat> so it's really important and i like i just liked it awesome so yeah it was 
it's just such an amazing journey learning about all this. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's wild every time like we end. It's like, you know, 444 four, four, number one, like these <laughs> angel numbers. And I like how they said 555, five, five, 10, 10, 10 and all that going back and forth. But it's such an amazing experience what we're doing here. And we just love it so much, guys. It's Man, I mean, just sitting down for an hour and watching all this, we love doing this. Like, we're so excited and so happy that you guys are watching it. If you made it this far, I love you guys Thank so you. much. <laughs> like, seriously, I really do. We we both love you guys. And uh, if, yeah, just watching the video is enough. If you do want to donate, the link is down below. We would greatly appreciate it if you did want to donate because it's so much time and effort to do all this, even editing a video that's an hour long. It can take three hours sometimes, but we're doing it all on our own. So everything is like, it's just us. So thank you guys nice. so much for watching. We're going to try and get more people to react to Islam. We're going to try to spread the word as much as we can. Thank you guys so much. See we'll see you in, in the next, next video. video.